Good evening and very warm greetings and welcome to our first Global Leadership Dialogue, an event of great magnitude with thousand potentials. On behalf of the Confederation of the Indian Micro, Small, Medium Enterprises, I welcome a hearty grand welcome to our industry experts from Trinidad and Tobago, to Mr. Philip Nag, Mr. Siko Allen, Mr. Ms. Deborah Thompson, and Mr. Nirat Tewari. And also a very cordial welcome to the Indian speakers, Mr. Ashwani Kumar and Mr. Neeraj Mitran. And also a warm welcome to the council members of CIMSME and the other participants. My name is Mishma Stanislaus, the Global Communication Head of CIMSME, and I take the pleasure of moderating today's event. So the Global Leadership Dialogue, you'll have been hearing this for the past couple of days. It is an initiative of the Confederation of the Indian Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises, CIMSME, and Global Council for the Promotion of International Trade, which are both units of International Council of Technology, Management and Applied Engineering, a registered nonprofit organization in India, as well as in the USA and Spain. The Confederation is a network of 9,000 plus entrepreneurs who focus on business growth, personal development, and community engagement. It is a national business network of leading entrepreneurs built to educate, transform, inspire, and offer invaluable resources in the form of national events, leadership development programs, online entrepreneur forums, and so on. It is a cross linkage between people from various facets, such as knowledge institutions, industry experts, business personnel, government bodies, and so on, that complement each other for a holistic growth. So welcome again to this global uh, leadership program, which will be a series of uh, dialogue with various countries, and we're expecting 30 plus countries. It is the single most largest inclusive platform for collaborative growth, which I'm sure you'll agree it is the need of the hour. The impending pandemic has left us with no choice but to, to move towards a collaborative society and to sustain the post-COVID world. So in the effort to achieve this, we are with our delegation from Trinidad and Tobago today. So before we move to the core of the event, I would like to share the rapport between the two countries. So the relationship between Trinidad and Tobago and India goes back to 30th May 1845, when the first ship, Patel Razak, carrying 225 Indian workers, reached the shores of Trinidad. And ever since, the presence of a substantial population of Indian origin has contributed immensely to the bilateral relations between the two countries. And the two countries have signed more than 20 agreements and MOUs. And we hope today's session will further strengthen the social, economic, and the cultural ties between these two beautiful countries. And on that note, I would like to invite our first speaker, Mr. Philip Nags, to talk about InvestTT and the opportunities therein. To say a few words about Mr. Philip Nags, he is the chairman of Invest Trinidad and Tobago, a national investment promotion agency aligned under the Ministry of Trade and Industry, established in 2012. He is also an accomplished business executive with more than 15 years of experience in the global automobile industry as a director at Massey Motors and president of the Automobile Dealers Association. Mr. Philip has leveraged his years of experience in global reach, strategic thinking, and analytical skills to act as an agent of change in Trinidad and Tobago's investment promotion agency, InvestTT. It is a pleasure to have you with us, sir, here today. Over to you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Very pleased to be here today. My name, as, as stated, is Philip Nags. I am the chairman of InvestTT, um, located in Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago is a twin island country located at the southern end of the Caribbean chain of islands, just eight miles off the coast of South America. InvestTT is the investment promotion agency, which is an IPA of Trinidad and Tobago. We were formed in 2012. Our mandate really is to attract and retain foreign direct investment into Trinidad and Tobago. We focus on many areas, many investment areas, 
We are quite successful and have received many international awards. Um, our services range from um, facilitation to attraction in many areas, manufacturing, man maritime services, um, business process outsourcing, etc. So thank you very much for having me here today. Very pleased to be here. And I can now hand you over to our VP of Investment Services at InvestTT, Mr. Sekou Alain, who can give us probably a, a better breakdown of the country of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as um, what InvestTT has to offer. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I uh, appreciate the introduction. Thank you, Mishma, and thanks to all, uh, to Amcham especially, and CIM SME for inviting us, the Trinidad Tobago Delegation and InvestDT to present on investment opportunities in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, my name is Sekou Allen. I am the Vice President of Investments at InvestDT. My team leads on foreign direct investment attraction and facilitation into Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, the pres uh, presentation that I am going to cover will uh, demonstrate, give you more information about Trinidad and Tobago as an investment destination and its position in the region and globally, um, as well as specific investment opportunities that uh, medium-sized enterprises in India can avail themselves of immediately. My, are you seeing my slide deck? Thank you. So the presentation today will give you a little bit more information on InvestTT and the services that we offer, give you a bit of an overview on Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, the chairman would have started giving you a little bit of context. I will give you more. <clears throat> then the lion's share of the presentation will come off the specific opportunities, the areas uh, that you can invest in in Trinidad and Tobago and why you should. And then we'll take a little bit uh, of a look at the real estate opportunities and uh, the actual spaces that these investments can occupy within Trinidad and Tobago. So InvestDT really is, is your partner in business facilitation. We get involved in investments, foreign direct and local direct investments across the entire decision making process of the investment. So we'll support your investment interests. So pre uh, preparation of information and data on Trinidad and Tobago in your very specific uh, area of interest, any incentives that may apply to the particular investment. And we do real estate um, site advisory as well. So we will identify locations for the investments to occupy, um, full airport to airport site visit services. So visits into the country once we are again allowed to travel. Um, and so all the way we support you from the beginning through to your due diligence period and into the operationalization of the investment. Uh, approvals and applications for the approvals that are required for a particular type of business. InvestTT supports you through that and really fast tracks you into meeting your execution and your operational date. And then post investment, um, our team, our aftercare team continues to support uh, your investment, identifying any barriers, any challenges to the investment and removing those so that you can execute and meet um, your investment goals in Trinidad and Tobago. Some more facts on the country, and, and Michelle was a great, um, a great introduction talking about the long history um, of uh, relationship between India and Trinidad and Tobago. We are a, a nation of 1.4 million people, just eight miles off of Venezuela, and we'll talk a lot about that location and our positioning in the region and why it is important to investors. Um, our GDP is around 16,500 US dollars per capita, or a total uh, $23 billion GDP. Um, we are a constitutional republic like India. Our prime minister is the Honorable Keith Rowley and our head of state is Her, Ex uh, Her Excellency Paula May Weeks. Uh, we are English speaking uh, population and um, we will get a little bit more into the labor force benefits. Our labor force stands at around 634,100 people currently. Some more facts in terms of our trade positioning within the region. Um, we do have trade agreements. The major one is with the CARICOM um, region, which is the Caribbean community. Uh, most of the English speaking Caribbean islands, as well as Belize, Suriname and Guyana are part of the Caribbean uh, CARICOM common market. And CARICOM as a market has trade agreements, um, wide ranging trade agreements, Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, Costa Rica, and very importantly, and we'll talk about this later, the USA, um, and so access to those markets are provided duty-free 
from a hub of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, our main sectors and key sector is oil and gas. It is about 50% of our GDP. The benefits that we've received from uh, that oil and gas history is really the infrastructure that the, current, the, the country boasts, uh, our port, our road, our air, sea and air infrastructure, as well as our telecommunications infrastructure that is ready to accept investment. Uh, manufacturing is another, the second major sector for us. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is the manufacturing hub for the Caribbean region. And so you would see much of our goods and services being provided across CARICOM and into Central America. And of course, we are also the financial services hub of the Caribbean. And so um, uh, we are building on the platform of our success in those key sectors and looking to grow and attract investment on uh, the basis of the infrastructure and the support that those investments have provided for the country. Uh, one thing that really stands out uh, about Trinidad and Tobago as well is our uh, history of low occurrences as well of natural disasters. Uh, you would all be well aware of the hurricanes that come through the region every year. Trinidad is uh, so far south, the most southerly islands in the Caribbean, and so we have a history of not actually having to be affected by those hurricanes. Uh, and in terms of flight connectivity, we are direct flights into London, into New York, Toronto. Uh, into New York, it's about 4.5 4 hours, 8.2 hours into London. And so most Indian investors that do travel back and forth to Trinidad either connect through London and then a direct flight into India, or they connect um, from New York, which is, I believe it's about a nine hour flight into India from New York. So the connectivity into Trinidad and Tobago uh, is just one stop from India. Um, I will go now specifically into the areas and the investment opportunities that we believe are available for medium and even larger small size enterprises in Trinidad and Tobago. And the four main areas that we are going to be covering, uh, the first is electricity intensive manufacturing. Uh, the second is logistics, very important. Uh, our, uh, our location in the region makes this a, a great advantage. Uh, offshore transshipment, Again, our location as well as the Gulf of Paria. And um, what I will be starting off speaking about is the voice contact center. And I know this is an area that India uh, is a, a very large uh, participator in uh, globally. And so uh, we believe there are significant opportunities for Indian SMEs um, to um, get into the business of providing services into the US and Canadian market, which the Indian firms already do but from a near shore destination and English speaking destination. And so uh, the con voice contact centers in Trinidad and Tobago, there is a unique opportunity to set up uh, 200 to 300 or even larger seat English voice customer service and tech support operation to provide services into the North American market. Uh, we currently have a large US uh, based operator with 17 sites across the globe actually operating in Trinidad and Tobago as we speak. Uh, and they're supporting co uh, companies like Amazon from Trinidad. They're supporting 1-800-Flowers, Metro PCS, uh, some financial services firms. They are about to up to uh, uh, about a thousand seats. And so Indian firms that are looking to provide a near shore opportunity for their clientele, a near shore location can operate from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, in terms of an English speaking voice, uh, voice call center agent, you're looking at just about 550 US dollars per month. Um, and so we're comparable to other near shore destinations for call center opportunities. Uh, and what sets us our side is really our very robust telecommunications infrastructure. The company iCore that I mentioned before actually was able to move to 100% work from home when the COVID crisis hit. They have now moved to um, uh, a mixed structure with some employees working out of the office and some employees working from home. And it really speaks to the strength of our telecommunications infrastructure as well as the living standards of, of the Trinidadian that uh, allows them to be able to provide those services from home. Our cultural affinity to the United States, of course, being connected by several flights, as well as uh, having a large diaspora in the US, uh, and most of our cable TV and internet, everything is from the US, and so the cult cultural affinity is strong. Our language and accent um, are also very strong. So again, for Indian firms trying to provide the best possible um, the best possible product and package for their clients in the US or trying to land new clients that would like a near shore destination, Trinidad and Tobago provides a really unique opportunity to do so. Um, the data I would have provided before in terms of average call center staff is um, as a function of a survey that we did in 2018, a very recent survey. 
And so those costs that we're seeing in terms of uh, the labor uh, has been experienced by ICO and has been experienced by other call centers in the country. There are also domestic call centers um, here that are open to partnership. So for Indian firms that would be looking to partner with a, a call center, they have availability for 200 to 300 seats to set up a pilot project with a local um, call center. And, and from there, they can then grow that operation. And, and so to mitigate the risk of entering into a new market, there are also joint venture opportunities in this specific area. Uh, Investity is actually currently facilitating a software development firm out of India as well uh, that is um, has its head office in Massachusetts, uh, has another near shore location in Jamaica and is now about to set up a 20 person software development site in Trinidad and Tobago to um, service their US clients. And so you already see some uh, Indian SMEs taking advantage of the opportunities in Trinidad and Tobago in the call center space, as well as higher up the food chain and the tech support and the software development space as well. Um, the second opportunity I'm going to be talking about is electricity intensive manufacturing. Uh, on the basis of uh, Trinidad and Tobago being able to generate its own electricity through the use of gas and our power plants, we have a very low uh, cost of energy. At the lowest, it is three cents per kilowatt hour. And so in the region, it is really the only lower is Venezuela, but of course, Venezuela has its own challenges. And so um, any intense electricity intensive manufacturing or any electricity intensive production um, would uh, benefit a lot from that low cost of energy. Uh, there are specific opportunities in those areas that we've identified. Um, we have a large aluminum recycling industry. In fact, uh, looking at the export figures from Trinidad and Tobago, we'd see that there are a high amount of exports in scrap iron out into India. And what one can do is actually process that using our electricity in Trinidad and Tobago and then export that out to foreign markets uh, as a process and a processed and higher value product. Um, and some of the area, other areas, energy storage batteries, um, LED manufacturing and assembly, and particular water-based paints, um, biodegradable plastics, solar powered rechargeable electronics, any of those areas that are electricity intensive um, can benefit from the very low cost of energy in Trinidad and Tobago, and then can also benefit from the trade agreements that give us access to the US market, the Colombian market, uh, Dominican Republic, Cuba, et cetera. And so what you're really looking at is a low cost base production location that then gives you access to the markets that Indian firms are either currently accessing or looking to access. And so just a bit of a comparative cost, uh, as I would have mentioned in the region, we are the lowest cost of electricity, even at the highest end at seven cents, we range between three and seven cents, even at the seven cents, we are still the lowest cost in the region. Logistics uh, is the next opportunity I would like to highlight. And again, on the basis of our location at basically the crossroads of the Americas and our positioning as the economic uh, hub um, of the region, both financial and manufacturing, uh, it really gives those um, that are looking for the opportunity to set up a third party logistics hub um, that will allow you to provide integrated logistical solutions not only to the local market, but into the CARICOM market, as well as the wider um, Central American region. We actually recently had a Costa Rican firm um, that has is setting up a third party logistics operation in Trinidad and Tobago in partnership with a local manufacturer. And so what they've seen is that that has lowered very substantively the cost of imports into um, Trinidad from the Central American region. Uh, this integrated logistics facility allows them to lower those costs and so benefits themselves as well as their local joint venture partner. And again, the access to the region the, um, through our trade agreements and in the first instance, CARICOM allows you to use our locational benefits, use our port and sea infrastructure, which is highly, um, highly robust and internal road and airport infrastructure to give you access to those markets. And so um, for Indian firms that are currently uh, doing trade in the CARICOM region and the U.S. region, uh, a logistics hub in Trinidad and Tobago really makes sense and InvestIT is poised to provide any information and data to you uh, that would benefit you in terms of that investment. And just again, a little bit uh, more context in terms of our location just here off of Venezuela and then the major markets that we then have access to through our trade, trade agreements. Uh, so up to a billion people that you are able to access. We'll talk a little bit more about the maritime industry now. And so uh, again, because of our location, and you will see location here come up a lot 
in what I speak to because it really gives us that unique perspective and unique ability to, to facilitate and um, have investment succeed. Uh, in terms of offshore transshipment, Trinidad is positioned right at uh, the north end of South America where more, most of the bauxite and other bulk materials come from that are then shipped out across the world and particularly to Asia. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago provides the opportunity to do offshore bulk transshipment. And so the barges that are coming out of the rivers of South America then come up to Trinidad and um, transship those goods onto a larger ocean going vessel, which then uh, provides uh, the shipping services into Asia. And so we already have organizations that are doing this. There's a large German company by the name of Oldendorf. They are transshipping bauxite and iron ore uh, in Trinidad and Tobago uh, offshore into the uh, Asian region. And certainly we have space and scope for many other operations um, in that uh, in that regard. And again, our large naturally sheltered deep harbor, it is the Gulf of Paria, and our positioning outside of the hurricane belt uh, bodes well for business continuity and also bodes well for the ability to lower the costs of shipping bulk goods from South America into Asian markets. And so uh, we have a very close relationship with the Maritime Services Division that has provided an entire policy and approach to how one can access the transshipment operations. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the Gulf of Paria. This is Trinidad and Tobago's western coastline. This is the tip of Venezuela. So as the chairman said, we are just eight miles off. On a clear day, we can see them. And the areas in the Gulf of Paria where one can uh, operate transshipments operations are outlined in this map here. And so we are ready to accept new operations in that area. Um, and the last is coal stacking, ship uh, layups, warm and coal layups. Uh, again, based on those same locational and Gulf of Paria benefits, ships that are temporarily idle, and we're seeing that happening a lot in, in the current COVID crisis and some of the challenges in the oil and gas industries. Uh, ships that are idle due to lack of cargo or issues with their industries uh, can lay up in Trinidad and Tobago. And, 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 and uh, it's a cheaper approach as opposed to operating the ship as um, you can then lay those up on a coal or warm layup basis. Uh, coal layup uh, suitable for vessels up to five years out of service. Uh, and then warm layup suitable for vessels uh, with just um, with a projected 12 months out of service. Again, our large naturally sheltered harbor and hurricane safety record uh, makes this uh, operation very safe to uh, do in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, we have uh, a large uh, oil and gas firm uh, by the name of Transocean that at its peak was coal stacking nine ships in Trinidad and Tobago, large oil rig drill ships, oil, oil rig drilling ships. Uh, nine uh, maximum, and I believe they still have about five of those ships. As those ships come back into service, they then go um, globally and, and offer their services, but they are cold stack in Trinidad. And again, much more scope for those types of activities in Trinidad and Tobago. And again, the same approved zones and free structure um, that are already provided by maritime services that can be accessed through InvestDT. Um, and so those are the four main opportunity areas that InvestDT is poised to facilitate and access investment into Trinidad and Tobago. They are not the only areas that we will accept investment in. Of course, InvestDT will facilitate investments in areas outside of that. The only area we do not uh, deal with is oil and gas. And even then, we have great relationships with the agencies in the oil and gas industry. And so we can provide a warm uh, transfer to those agencies. However, uh, we are poised and ready for accepting investments. Um, uh, to, and we also have access and available um, Tamina Intec Park being one. It is the science and technology park located in the east end of Trinidad and Tobago, just about a 10 minute drive from the airport. So has been a locational benefits based on that. And that science and technology park currently has 19 uh, land lots available for rent and 30,000, sorry, 14,000 square feet of office space available for uh, software development activities. In fact, the call center that I talked about earlier, um, ICOR, is actually located in um, the Tamina Intec Park and operating from the office space that I mentioned. The park actually boasts its own um, electricity hub on the park now, and so the infrastructure is in place uh, for accepting investments. And um, a park to be built, Phoenix Park Industrial Estate, 
Uh, this park, as you would see with Tamina that is located near the airport, this park is located uh, about a 10 minute drive from our major import port, which is the port of Point Lisas. This park is located on 144 acres of land in central Trinidad, uh, and it is um, going to be built to access investments in the manufacturing uh, and distribution area. So where we talked about logistics earlier, uh, much of the logistics investments that we will see happening will be located at this park, given its close proximity to the port and the imports and exports. And of course, this park is also located in close proximity to the major north-south highway that travels not too far from the western coast and then puts you into accessing um, the east-west corridor, which is a major um, uh, area of commerce and residential activity in Trinidad and Tobago as well. And so what you see really is the immediate access to the opportunities so electricity intensive manufacturing, voice contact center, logistics, and ship layups and transshipment opportunities through InvestDT, which will hold your hand through all those opportunities and immediately access to the real estate that can get your um, investment operational sooner rather than later. And the team in InvestDT is ready and willing to provide that support and hold your hand all through the investment period and post the investment uh, with the support of our chairman, who you heard from earlier, and our small, very but very talented team, InvestDT is poised to provide those opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Siko Allen, for that wonderful uh, share of information. And some have asked questions to know a bit more about you. So a brief introduction about uh, Mr. Siku. Uh, he was involved in the attraction and facilitation of the setup of Trinidad and Tobago's first international call center ICO, which he has talked about in the presentation. And the primary focus for Mr. Siku at uh, InvestTT is attracting investment to his country's business process outsourcing sector. And as the leader of the investments division at InvestTT, Mr. Siku is highly motivated to engage in sector growth activities, including interaction with existing participants, site selector consultant engagement, as well as investor awareness, outreach, and facilitation. So it was a pleasure having you with us today. And uh, I do have a question for you. So one of our MSMEs would like to know, uh, what is the scope for setting up a business uh, in interior decorations? Interior decorations? Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not one of our investment opportunities, but of course, again, we do facilitate investments outside of those areas. Uh, okay. so, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, um, our GDP per capita does make us one of the wealthier nations in the region. And certainly the residential construction sector and home sector is a large sector. Um, and certainly uh, interior decorations uh, would be one of the supporting services for that particular sector. And so, okay. yes. That there, there would be opportunities in, in decoration. Very, very interesting area. To, to yes, uh, <laughs> I was quite surprised by that question too. And the same uh, entrepreneur would also like to know what is the availability of timber in the ecosystem of Trinidad and Tobago? Uh, we, we do have a significant amount of teak in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and in fact, we have received uh, interest from Indian investments in that area, investors in that area as well. Um, uh, we have a good relationship with the forestry division of the Ministry of Agriculture um, and they have a request for proposal process that they go through in order to allocate land for uh, sawmills um, for the harvesting <clears throat> and production of teak. Now, um, as it stands with the regulations now, one would have to do a significant amount of value add and processing of that teak in order to okay. receive to export it. So the tea cannot be exported in its raw form. You would you would need to process it either into furniture or into a more processed good that can then go into furniture to be able to receive the license to export. It. Okay, I okay. think we can take one last question. Uh, what are the opportunities available for the automobile sector? Uh, I don't know. Maybe the chairman should answer this question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so because he's yes, the yes, director at Massey Motors. So <laughs> perfect question for you, uh, Chair. Sure. Um... I seem to be frozen on the screen. Am I am I coming through okay? Yes, yes. we're here on scene. Fine. All right. Yeah, the automotive sector um, is still very vibrant in Trinidad and Tobago. We have had some Indian vehicles um, landed in the past without a lot of traction. Mahindra was one of them. Um, 
And I think the, the so all the major, major manufacturers and importers are here. So we have Nissan, Toyota, Suzuki, um, Mitsubishi, Mazda, almost all of the brands, the worldwide brands, the big ones are represented in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, however, there, there are a lot of emerging Indian brands that could present um, a possible opportunity for Trinidad and Tobago. And the opportunities there would probably be centered around either hybrid or electric vehicles or vehicles of smaller engine size because because of the way that our taxes and duties are structured there are some um, it makes it easier for vehicles with lower cc ratings or electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles to come into the country so if i were an indian manufacturer and i were looking to get into the the market in trinidad I would be, I would be concentrating in those three areas, because the the other sectors of the market are very very well saturated at this point. And as Mr. Allen said earlier, um, perhaps the greater opportunity may lie in manufacturing or distribution of automotive parts. Given the fact that we have a very, very low electricity rate, three cents per kilowatt hour, and we have duty free and unrestricted access into North America, which is the big market. So we have a very large natural harbor. We're very close to South America. We have the largest natural harbor in the Western Hemisphere. Low electricity rates, and we have some industrial parks coming online, which will have also, which will also have um, special tax concessions for the companies that come in. So if I were an Indian company in the automotive sector or otherwise, I would be trying my best to get into that particular, one of those particular parts, enjoy the ge geographic access that we have, because we can very easily become a hub, use the very, very low electricity rates and the skilled labor force and manufacture goods, automotive or otherwise, for access straight into North America unrestricted. I think that's where the big opportunities really lie. Okay, so we do have a lot of questions and very interesting questions, but unfortunately due to time constraints, I have to stop here. And uh, we will find a way uh, so that you all can answer these questions. And if you, could, if you can share a link of your forum or anything of that sort, then the MSMEs can contact you directly. Absolutely. So on that note, uh, I extend again a heartfelt gratitude towards Invest Trinidad and Tobago for being with us, both to Mr. Philip Nags and Mr. Seiko Allen. So thank you. Thank you for being with us and hope to have future collaborations together. Absolutely. And we look forward to it. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very much. And thank you to Amcham as well for facilitating. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. OK. And next, moving on, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Deborah Thompson to take over. So Mr. Deborah Thompson is from the Corporate Secretarial Services. She's completed her LLB with honors from the University of London in 1986 and as utter barrister in 1987 at the Honorable Society of uh, Lincoln's Inn in United Kingdom. Mr. Deborah received a bar admission into England and Wales and in Trinidad and Tobago in 1987. She joined M. Hamel Smith & Co. in January 2001 after spending 10 years in the corporate environment. Ms. Deborah is the partner responsible for the corporate secretarial services and acquainted with the changes and the implications of the amendments to the Companies Act. She also practices the role of senior instructing attorney in areas such as litigation, commercial disputes in the financial, telecommunications, medical negligence, mortgages, and construction sectors, in addition to her involvement in arbitrations. She is also a member of the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago. It is a privilege to have you with us here today, ma'am, and the stage is all yours. Thank you, Mishma. Thank you to 
I'm Cham and CIM CME for this opportunity to present. For companies that wish to set up in Trinidad, that's the Indian companies that wish to set up, I'm here to give you an overview of setting up a business in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I do have a slideshow, but I'm not seeing that it's up right now. Mishma, is the presentation the slideshow going to be put up? Okay, so I'm here to give you an overview of how to set up a business in Trinidad and Tobago. So there's several options for an investor to set up a commercial presence here in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm going to spend some time speaking about choosing the right corporate vehicle, the associated legal framework in order to achieve the objective of setting up the right company, and the various registrations and formalities that will impact setting up the business. The main options that we have here in order to set up a commercial presence would be firstly, the incorporation of a limited or unlimited liability for-profit company, i.e. a subsidiary of a foreign entity, or you can register a branch of a foreign entity. You can set up a partnership, joint venture or sole trader. Our Foreign Investment Act does affect foreign investors and their ability to own an interest in a public company and or to form a locally incorporated entity here in Trinidad. And there are tax issues which affect foreign investment in Trinidad. And those tax issues may determine the choice of structure used to pursue an investment. And I will touch on those briefly later on. The employment relationships in Trinidad are governed by generally employment contracts and common law provision as well as legislation. There is no legislative requirement governing the form of an employment contract, but there are certain recommended good industrial relations practices and registrations that a foreign investor should be aware of. Quite often, tax consideration um, it's very important in deciding which corporate vehicle to go with. And therefore, if you do intend to set up in Trinidad, it's useful before embarking on incorporation or registration to obtain tax advice with respect to the proposed business activity in Trinidad. So let's touch upon some of the vehicles. Incorporating a limited liability company. The process is really quite simple and you can be achieved in a short period of time, four to five days, providing all the necessary information and documentation is made available to us. Now, post COVID, the time has been affected because uh, submitting documents to the registry is still manual for most of the uh, documents that have to be submitted in. And in order to gain access to the registry, it's by appointment only. And those appointments are quite spread out. Um, we hope they will be going digital soon, so things will and should improve. So the steps to incorporate the company is the name approval, this is digital, um, to the company's registry. And it generally takes about one to two days, and they're quite good at responding. Once the name approval has been, has been granted, then the articles of incorporation will be filed together with the various notices uh, detailing who the directors are, the addresses, the secretary and the assistant registry, register. After incorporation, the organizational minutes and the issuing of shares will take place. In Trinidad, the company must have a minimum of one share. This is a private company, limited or unlimited. So once the company has been incorporated, then the organizational minutes and issuance of shares take place. There is a minimum of one share. Um, so a company um, has a minimum of one share, then you have the adoption of your bylaws. Now, in order to open a bank account in Trinidad, the banks will ask all of your incorporation documents and your bylaws um, before they will consider opening an account for you. In incorporating a limited liability company of a private company, there's a minimum of two directors. Now there's no requirement that they be local directors. However, in order to register the company for the, to the Board of Inland Revenue for tax purposes, the Board of Inland Revenue has in practice 
required that two directors with a local BIR number be a direct director of the company. Our foreign investment notice, in the case of a locally incorporated company, uh, where there is a foreign shareholder, there is an obligation pursuant to our Foreign Investment Act to file a notice with the Ministry of Finance. Now, once incorporated, the limited liability company becomes a separate legal entity with perpetual succession. It can therefore enter into contracts and be sued. And the liability of its shareholders is limited to the unpaid amount of the shares. Any foreign investor from India that is seeking to strengthen its commercial presence and operations in Trinidad, operating a local subsidiary, may create the impression that the company is rooted locally. And this in turn can lead to greater acceptance through local business environment, especially when compared to a foreign company operating through an agent. Right, another vehicle by which a business can enter Trinidad is the registering a branch of an external company. So a foreign company can register a branch of a company that exists in India. And our legislation requires that within 14 days after that external company establishes a place of business in Trinidad, it must register at the with the local company's registry. Again, the registration process involves an application for registration, which details the corporate structure of the external company and the proposed structure of the branch in Trinidad and various documents must be certified and submitted. These would include the charter documents, the memorandums and articles, and all of the other corporate instruments defining the constitution of the company. An affidavit must be submitted from one of the directors verifying the accuracy of the corporate instruments. And a power of attorney must be executed in favor of either a locally incorporated company or two or more taxed residents persons and that is empowering them to accept service in Trinidad and Tobago of all legal processes. It's known as the branch attorney in fact. A non-resident company in Trinidad is liable for corporation tax on income arising or derived from trade or business carried on by it in Trinidad and for tax purposes Resident is where the mind and management takes place. The after-tax profits of a branch, whether or not submitted abroad or remitted abroad, are deemed to be distribution and repatriated and subject to withholding tax. A branch office of an external company is required to also file companies annual returns within 30 days of the anniversary date of its registration and all changes in directors and alterations of its constitutional documents must also be filed. Another vehicle by which a business can be conducted in Trinidad is through a partnership. Our Partnership Act provides for the creation of partnerships where the parties carry on business with a common view to making a profit and this is without incorporating that entity. A partnership can be very quickly formed and it depends on the requirements of the parties. It can be oral, it can be written, um, and it can be implied from the conduct of the parties. Now, there can be a partnership between individuals or between an individual and a company. Unlike a limited liability company, a partnership is not a separate legal entity. And therefore, the partners have joint and several unlimited liability for all of the debts and obligations of the partnership. In Trinidad, limited liability partnerships are not available for effecting business. In A partnership does, however, have fewer formal requirements than a company. It's very easy to dissolve and wind up, unlike a company, which is much more complex to liquidate. But there are certain characteristics of a partnership that can be inconvenient when compared to a company. So careful consideration will need to be given. Also, in a partnership, the addition of a new partner could, not always so, but it could require the dissolution and liquidation of the entire partnership. A joint venture, as Seiko spoke about earlier today, 
a business person based abroad or an external company can seek to partner with a local company to form a joint venture. The parties in a proposed joint venture can choose to structure the arrangements either as a joint venture company specifically set up for that purpose, in which case there could be a limited liability joint venture company. If a joint venture company is an unlimited company, then technically it will be an unlimited company. Um, but if the shareholders are limited liabilities, then it, you know, there's some uh, protection in terms of liability. You can also have a partnership agreement, in which case there's a joint and several unlimited liability. But the parties themselves can be, again, can be limited liability companies. And then you can have a purely contractual arrangement in the form of a joint venture agreement. In a joint venture conducted through the vehicle of a separate legal entity, the various forms of the articles and the bylaws can be made up of a combination of various forms of protection for the majority shareholders, the minority shareholders, and their arrangements can be put in place for any deadlock, deadlock arrangements where the company's actions require unanimous agreement between the parties, for example, in an event of disagreement, the parties can make an agreement where one party can buy out the other or the company can be dissolved. In making the choice, the parties will need to contemplate the various circumstances and the nature and duration of the transaction to see what the best uh, venture, joint venture uh, would be. A sole trader is the last option, which is a business person can set up a business locally as a sole trader and register as a business name the organization. This method is much less formal and carries does also carry the risk of unlimited liability to the individuals. If an individual, that individual does not hold Trinidad and Tobago citizenship, then a work permit would have to be obtained. And this process can be onerous. So I just want to touch on the for our Foreign Investment Act. So for the purposes of our Foreign Investment Act, a foreign investor is effectively any corporation incorporated outside of CARICOM or the, Car the Caribbean community. And even if it is so incorporated, once it is owned and controlled by a person who is not a citizen, then it's deemed to be a foreign investor. Any individual who is not a national of Trinidad and Tobago or another CARICOM state is deemed also to be a foreign investor. Now, a foreign investor in Trinidad or from India, an Indian investor would be permitted to own 100% of the share capital of a private company. But prior to the acquisition of shares, um, they would require notice to be given to the Minister of Finance. An Indian investor would also be permitted to own up to 30% of the total share capital of a local public company. They would require a license if anything more than 30% is acquired. A foreign investor can acquire land up to one acre of land for residential purposes without obtaining a license and for business or trade up to five acres. Um, and consideration for shares or land is generally to be paid for by international traded currency. No one in Trinidad is permitted to hold land or shares in a local company in trust for a foreign investor. OK, so I just wanted to touch upon some of the tax um, regulations. Uh, companies that invest in Trinidad or set up in Trinidad are themselves required to register with the Board of Inland Revenue and to get unique tax registration numbers. These numbers are assigned following the appropriate tax registration forms being submitted by the company to the relevant authority. And the principal direct taxes in Trinidad are, we have a business levy tax, which is payable quarterly at a rate of 0.6% on the gross sales and receipts of the company. This can be set off against a business levy liability of the company in the following year. And there's no liability in the first three years after registration in respect of gross sales, which do not exceed $300,000. Corporate tax. Our corporate tax is 
tax at a rate of 25% of the profits of the short-term gains of a company accruing in or derived from Trinidad and Tobago. Some sectors, oil and gas, for example, are charged at a higher rate of 35%. So you'd have to check that if you were setting up in Trinidad. Of course, we can advise on it. There's a green fund levy, which we have, which is a tax on gross sales and receipts of companies and unincorporated associations. And this is at a rate of 0.3%. Um, we also have with holding tax, which is a tax on various income payments to non-residents. So and these rates vary from 5, 10 to 15%, depending on, on what, what it is that is being distributed. Now in Trinidad, we have value added tax, which is a tax which is applied to both goods and services and charged at a rate of 12.5%. So where the commercial supply of the company exceeds 500,000 during any preceding 12 month period, or is likely to exceed that sum during the next 12 month period, then the business should register for tax. In terms of employees, we have a tax on individual income. We have a health surcharge, which if the employee's salary is less than $500, $500 sorry, a month, then the weekly surcharge is $4.80. And if it's over $500, it's $8.25. And we also have a ch income tax on chargeable income at a rate of 25%. Human resources. Now, there's no legislation which requires government. There, sorry, there's no legislative requirement governing the form of an employment contract. So you're free, free to set up any contract. However, common law stat and statute do require good industrial relations and may impose duties and obligations on employers. Employers are required, as I said previously, to register with the Board of Inland Revenue and the NIB. Currently, the minimum wage in Trinidad and Tobago is $17.50 per hour, which works out to roughly 193 rupees per hour. Employers operate most employers in Trinidad operate pension plans which are very common but they're not required by law pension plans are approved by the board of inland revenue and they must be registered with the central bank and they do attract tax exemptions they are also transferable upon termination of employment health insurance again Employers do sponsor health plans in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's not required by law, but again, it's common practice. Our Occupational Health and Safety Act, or OSHA, is the framework which governs the health and safety in the workplace. And all employers have a general common law duty to take reasonable care for the safety of their employees. There's, we also have a Workmen's Compensation Act, which does require employers to take out insurance to cover workmen compensation of its employees. We have the Equal Opportunity Act in Trinidad and Tobago, which also prohibits discrimination. So that in a nutshell is an overview of what it would take to set up in Trinidad and Tobago, a commercial enterprise. There's the various vehicles that you choose from and having chosen one of those vehicles, there are various uh, regulatory requirements. But before setting up a business in Trinidad, I think the first stop would, to be get, would be to obtain tax advice so that you could find out which one of those vehicles would best promote the best tax uh, advantages to you in setting up in Trinidad. Now, I know it's a lot of information, so Hamel Smith and Amcham, we've collaborated to produce a business guide for Trinidad and Tobago, and it will cover, it does cover in detail the information which I've just shared for you, and it provides contact details for Amcham's, TNT Amcham's 300 members um, in this by sector, and the publication is available for sale through Amcham if any one of you are interested. And it can be obtained through the AmCham TT's website or through the host to this.
Um, so there we have it, and that brings an end to my presentation. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing about the legal framework, setting up businesses in Trinidad and Tobago. So I think uh, Biju, sir, will take up a few questions. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions, uh, Ms. So, uh, one is, uh, is there any minimum investment that is required to start a business in uh, Trinidad and Tobago? No, there's no, there's no minimum sum. Um, investments can range from small to large. Okay, thank you. So, the next question is: Can an Indian startup, uh, or can an Indian start a partnership firm with one of the local partners there? Yes, you can set up a partnership. is a very ad hoc arrangement. So, you can have an Indian uh, investor partnering with a local investor. Now, a partnership is not a limited liability company. So the liability in that partnership would vest with the individuals, each individual, all right? And the partnership arrangement would be governed generally by the partnership agreement between the two parties. You can add a layer of protection by incorporating one of the parties to the partnership. So if the Indian business person were a limited liability company, that could partner with a limited liability company in Trinidad to form a partnership and in that way the uh, exposure would be limited by the limited liability company okay thank you so i think uh, those are the questions for now uh, we can move on to the next uh, speaker thank you okay so thank you once again miss deborah thompson for boiling down a complex uh, information such as legal framework into layman's terms so next up we have mr nirat tewari the ceo of american Chamber of Commerce in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Nirad has 20 years of experience in media, communications, management, education, and international relations. Mr. Nirad is a member of the Wilton Park Caribbean 2030 Leaders Network and was appointed to the National Tripartite Advisory Council by the Honorable Dr. Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Narad was also formerly the CEO of the TNT Coalition of Services Industries, Chairman of the Caribbean Network of Services Coalitions, a member of the Communications and Public Affairs Division of the Commonwealth Secretariat in London, and a columnist for the Trinidad Guardian. It is great to have you with us today, sir. Over to you. Hi, uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone who is on this webinar, because I gather most people are in India. To so those of you who are in the Western Hemisphere, good morning. Um, AmCham is a, a local organization with a network of 25 AmChams in this hemisphere, but of course there are more than 100 AmChams globally. And through that we form, um, we, we, we are able to connect greatly. I was asked to speak a little bit about clusters so i just want to thank the confederation for the opportunity to work with you and to reach some of your members uh, in this process trinidad and tobago is a is a very very dynamic economy in the western hemisphere um, like all countries we have our, our ups and downs but we have the largest economy in the english-speaking caribbean we have the largest services sector the largest financial sector and of course, Sikh would have mentioned the oil and gas industry, which really is our biggest cluster. So you have upstream producers, you have many of the major oil and gas companies in the world, BP, Shell, BHP, and the like, are all here producing gas primarily, but some oil as well. And then, of course, you would have the petrochemical sector, so our Point Lisas Industrial Estate, which takes the gas as a feedstock and turns it into uh, ammonia, methanol, and urea. And then you have all of the companies that keep those plants going, that keep the platforms operational and supply the inputs and uh, tools and components to keep the industry going. So that's the, that's the energy services sector. So those are all almost all local companies. There are some international companies as well in there, and they are providing global uh, quality service and expertise to the oil and gas sector as well. In terms of cluster development, Seku would have spoken a lot about um, call centers and the potential there. 
And my view, and we've been doing some work on this for years, and at Amcham TNT, we have um, a digital transformation committee. My view is that there is huge potential in technology. So whether we go into a specific niche of technology, such as um, health information technology or the like, between what InvestET would have pointed out, the nearshoring opportunities and the cultural similarity, as well as the time zone congruence with the Eastern United States in particular, um, there is a lot, a lot of potential for the development of software, data analytics, and the like. Um, we have explored data centers. We have, um, you know, Sekou would have spoken about um, energy intensive uh, industries. I'm not sure what the economics around um, blockchain development would be or, or um, mining of, of, of Bitcoin or the like. Um, but those are possibilities to be explored. And we have universities that are doing computer science, computer engineering, software engineering. Um, we have research institutes that have MOUs with um, Indian equivalent firms, namely Kariri, um, so that the, the ability to interlink is quite high, uh, particularly, as I said, in software development. We already import quite a number of medicines from India as well as medical supplies. Many doctors uh, here would uh, use Indian manufactured medical supplies, um, such as scalpels and the like. Um, so, but Trinidad and Tobago's biodiversity is one of, the mo one of the greatest in the world, and therefore a huge potential as well from our point of view is in the pharmaceutical sector and, and uh, biomedical research so that there's a lot of potential here to conduct research using our plants um, and our flora and fauna. We have a, a chair of Ayurvedic sorry, medicine at, uh, uh, at UWE uh, that was facilitated via one of those agreements that um, Seiko would have mentioned earlier. So the potential is there in that sector as well. Also, the, there's also significant potential in the um, education sector. We, we have some students who travel to India in particular um, to do studies, and I, I think there's a lot of potential for that. Um, I don't know if someone missed it or came in late, but Seiko would have mentioned the airlink. So, I mean, direct flights in New York and London, and therefore onward to some Indian cities. Um, as well, it's fairly straightforward. What I'd like to say about Trinidad and Tobago in closing, because really I was hoping that this part would be a little more um, interactive, is that our people are very adaptable. And because we are a country in which there's so much mixing of uh, cultures over time, Indians, Africans, um, Syrians, Lebanese, Europeans, Americans, we've had oil and gas, oil here since 1908. We're very adaptable people, and we're very used to interacting with foreigners in a way that is mutually beneficial and productive. So you would find that you have a, not only a business sophistication and a willingness to engage, but also a surprising quality of life um, here in the Caribbean. Um, and here in Trinidad and Tobago, that is different and a little more dynamic than elsewhere in the Caribbean. In addition to which, um, the Indian influence on our culture, whether it be Diwali, whether it be Ram Leela, whether it be in the structures, um, will be, if you don't know and, and you haven't experienced our culture, will be something that um, many people uh, would be able to relate to immediately and therefore would be an additional um, an, an additional aspect uh, of of congruence if you are to do business in Trinidad and Tobago. So I would leave it there and just answer one question that I saw keep coming up on, on the chat, which is uh, availability of timber. And Seku spoke to that 
but we also have um, Guyana next door, and, and Guyana has um, a number of um, significant species of, of timber. And Trinidad and Tobago, as Seiko would have mentioned, we have large regional furniture uh, and appliance uh, companies, and therefore the potential to manufacture here for the for the tourism sector, if it ever picks back up after COVID, as in hotels, hotel chains and the like, as well as for the large appliances with uh, large furniture and appliance chains that are located in Trinidad and Tobago, operating out of Trinidad and Tobago is quite high. And there'd be things like Green Heart, Purple Heart, Cabo Cali, um, Upper Mat, that kind of thing. Um, you can get uh, from Guyana as well as tea and cedar uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. So um, I'd stop there for now and um, open it up to questions with the permission of the host. Yeah, thank you very much, sir, and for sharing us, especially that uh, Trinidad and Tobago is such an open community. I'm sure that uh, puts all of us at more ease. And uh, we have a question for you. What do you think are the challenges that might arise in the inter internationalization of clusters? Well, I mean, the, the, the challenges are, are not unique to Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, it is, can you find the appropriate markets? Um, and then what, what are your specific needs? So we don't manufacture everything. Okay. And so depending on what, if you are doing, if you're, if you're talking about goods, you would need the, um, to ensure that you have a, an effective supply chain. Uh, but Trinidad and Tobago, all of the major logistics companies are, are well established here and use it as their regional hub, DHL, FedEx, UPS. Um, they use Trinidad and Tobago as, as their regional hub. There's a, another company called Amerijet that moves um, cargo and has operations in India as well. Um, so they, once you have the supply chain, once you understand your business and, and know um, what you need, then the interna internationalization of clusters um, is not difficult. And then, of course, you can work with the universities that are here um, to develop capacity or um, chambers of commerce and the like to do training. And, and there may be even opportunities, as I said, in education, so that mm. if there's a gap, um, companies can work with other training institutes from other places. So, for example, um, it's not in Trinidad and Tobago, but next door in Guyana, they they discovered significant oil reserves. And then realizing that they don't have all of the human resources required. I mean, they're getting a lot of the human resources from Trinidad and Tobago. As I told you, we have a, a right. competitive um, oil and gas services sector, but they also want to develop their local capacity. So part of what Exxon, which is the, the, the company that, has the largest discoveries is doing is they have brought in a training company um, and working with the government of Guyana to build capacity. So you can do that here and, and we do that um, you know where the universities sometimes would and, and we have the uh, Arthur Lockjack Global School of Business which is doing work with the business sector and and um, can do customizable courses. One of the largest conglomerates in the region, the Master Group, which is headquartered in Trinidad and Tobago, just set up uh, the training Institute to do exactly that, which is to train leadership as well as skill development for industry. And so there's a lot of capacity to do that. And you'd find trainees are, are very, um, we call ourselves trainees or Trinbegonians, um, as I said, we're very entrepreneurial, and so if you have an anchor, um, an anchor business that needs support services, you will find that um, trainees would be very eager to engage in that either alone or in partnership. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll take a couple of more questions. One question about what are, what are the opportunities for setting up trading business in Trinidad and Tobago? Sorry, what do you mean by trading? Trading. Trading uh, at stock. Um, well, there are three stock exchanges in the region, um, Jamaica, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, the Barbados Stock Exchange, and the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange. And there are, there are several brokerage houses. So you have, um, for example, Royal Bank of Canada, or, well, locally RBC, Scotiabank, 
um, our Indigenous Bank, First Citizens Bank, as well as several stockbrokers that offer various levels of access to, um, you know, to stock exchanges around the world. Um, what I what I would say is that generally the so right now Trinidad and Tobago there's a, a high level of liquidity, um, yes. but we are because of the depressed oil and gas prices and and the global economy. We are a little bit challenged for foreign exchange, but if you can find ways to uh, give that um, liquidity access to a return, then you will find that people will be very interested. And as of now, with, you know, with the exception of a very few sophisticated investors, uh, and I'm talking about individuals and firms, they doesn't seem to be a lot of access to the market, to the to the Asian market, and therefore there may be some options for them specifically. I don't know if Seku wants to talk to that, but we also have a um, the Trinidad and Tobago International Financial Center, which is working on some of those things. So I'll, I'll ask Seku if he wants to add anything. Uh, yeah, here uh, I, the sure. more about uh, the, uh, the product, product. trading. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, buying products and selling it to businesses which are uh, looking to uh, use those products. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that, please? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is about uh, product uh, trading. So uh, one company can buy products and uh, keep selling it to businesses which are uh, planning to use those products in their business. Um, sure. So um, Seku would have mentioned that Trinidad and Tobago is a logistics hub for the region. And therefore, it, it makes sense if you want to um, if if you want to yeah, trade in the Caribbean that to use Trinidad and Tobago as a hub. Interestingly, our agreement with the European allows for if you're doing fabric or clothing, once there's value add in Trinidad in in the Car in the Caricom, that they get duty free, quota free access to the European market. So I'm not sure what the Indian arrangement is, but you can use, say, Indian fabric. And, and a lot of companies here do actually buy fabric from India already. Um, but you can do Indian fabric and turn them into garments and export to Europe, for example, uh, duty free. So, so yes, for products, Trinidad and Tobago is a good hub. We are the, as I said, the, the regional logistics center for DHL, UPS, FedEx, um, as well as for several of the conglomerates in the Caribbean who use Trinidad and Tobago as their central operations and then go out to the smaller islands as well. So the market is good for that if, you, if there's a demand for the product. Uh, we have one more question on the business opportunities for biotech companies working in agricultural inputs like fertilizers, pesticides, and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's high. So, so, I mean, of course, we have distributors here for the large brands, Monsanto, and so on. But our the, the, with, with the pandemic, there's increased focus on agriculture. We have had exchanges with Indian agricultural institutes mm -hmm. here. And in those exchanges, the, the, the information that I have is that the technology that we use and, and technology not necessarily being high tech, but simply spacing, um, weed control and the like mm -hmm. is not as sophisticated as it is in India. And so I think there are opportunities in agriculture in terms of knowledge transfer. And so mm -hmm. even in consulting, or um, if there are farms uh, in, in India that are looking to have a Western Hemisphere presence. Um, and now we don't, we have land, but, but we don't have vast and vast amounts of land. And so it would make sense to look at things that you can do where you make best use of land, whether it's stuck, um, stuck, stacking of agriculture and greenhouses and the like. Um, and I think that there would be opportunities in um, in some of the, as you say, fertilizers and pesticides and additives. Um, 
but you'd have to look at that on an individual basis. And of course, there are strong brands that are already in the country. So you'd have to make sure that you have agriculture, food and drug approval, the Bureau of Standards approval, um, and then um, you'd have to compete like you would at entering any new market. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, what are the popular products which are exported from Trinidad and Tobago? Well, our food and beverage, well, apart from oil, gas, ammonia, methanol, urea, yeah, okay. uh, our food and beverage products are, are among the things we soft drinks, um, at, at, you know, so flavored soft drinks in particular. Okay. Um, we have cosmetics. We have a company called Sasha Cosmetics that does uh, makeup and powders, particularly for targeting people. Um, non-Caucasians um, and it, it among the best in the world has been used in Miss U as the official um, cosmetic provider for Miss Universe uh, in the past mm -hmm. and the like and that's manufactured design tested here uh, with operations in Cuba um, now in Central America the US and so on so um, and they're available online that's another uh, uh, set of, of products um, Seku, do you want to jump in there at all? Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, we also export, um, I, I think you talked to beverages earlier. Um, uh, of course, the Angostura bitters is known worldwide. Um, so I, I, I believe I've seen the product when I was in there as well. Um, <laughs> and and, and we, we are producer and exporter of rum as well. Okay. Um, but, but certainly, um, outside of oil and gas, um, it's really financial services and manufacturing are the two, two main areas, particularly in food and beverage industries, that we have um, uh, successful in exporting. But we're really looking to grow that services side um, and providing services into the North American region, software development, call center, et cetera. Um, and so we, as we go into the next five to 10 years, we really think that expand those areas um, and also become so, so that we position ourselves as a regional services hub. Okay, so on that note, uh, there's another question. What is the market for beverages like Indian whiskeys? So Trinidad and Tobago, I mean, we, we consume a lot of whiskey. Okay. Uh, yeah, on a lighter to, note. <laughs> it tends to be Scotch whiskey, um, but okay. uh, some American bourbon is sold as well. Um, we have, a little bit of Japanese whiskey, not much consumption. Um, and so I guess it would depend on marketing quality and taste, but, but we do, um, people are always looking for, on the lookout for the whiskey in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay. Okay. Uh, so with that, I think we come to the end of the session with the experts from Trinidad and Tobago. So yeah, again, Yes, yes, um, please remember, go ahead. Hero, Hero is the sponsor. I see a question that keeps coming up about automobiles, and I know um, Mr. Nags would have, would have answered it. But yeah. Hero is the sponsor of the Caribbean Premier League, right? The CPL, uh, in which there's significant Indian investment. Charu Khan has the TKR, the Trinidad and Tobago Knight Riders, um, and we just got some Indian investment in the Trident. I can't remember uh, who the investor is. Um, at one time, Venkis was a sponsor as well. So, um, linking automobiles and sports, and of course, the, the, the film market here is, is, is huge. And I think there's a lot of potential for the music industry to collaborate and to do more. Um, but that's sort of um, uh, latent and not, not fully explored. Yes. Yes, I, I see that you're also interested in the arts and you've been an associate pr producer of a movie. So I'm yeah. sure you have a lot to say about the industry as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, again, on behalf of CIMSME, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to the members from the American Chambers of Commerce, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, for being with us and for sharing with us such invaluable information. So we'll move to the next part. And now we have our Indian experts. And uh, first up, we have Mr. Ashwani Kumar, who will throw light on the investment and trade opportunities here in India. So I also hope our friends from Trinidad and Tobago will now benefit from this part of the session. 
So Mr. Ashwani Kumar is the managing partner of Victor Forgings, which is a top supplier of hand and allied tools in Jalandhar. And he has ventured into Europe, USA, Middle East, uh, Africa, and Southeast, since, Southeast Asia since 1979 for the expansion of his business. And during the last years, he has held several government uh, positions in the government bodies. And recently, he was elected anonymously as the regional chairman, Northern Region of the Federation of Indian Export Organization. Mr. Ashwani was also the deputy regional chairman of Engineering Export Promotion Council, Northern Region from the year 2004 to 2010. He is also the secretary of Jalandhar Effluent Treatment Society and chairman of Jalandhar Management Association. In the realm of sports, he was also the honorary secretary of District Badminton Association in Jalandhar. Mr. Ashwani is also an active member of the, at the Jalandhar Chapter Integrated Association of SMEs of India as well. So it is great to have you, sir. Welcome for today's session and over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I was listening very carefully all uh, about Trinidad and Tobago. And I am sure it was very interesting. But my subject is, again, for everybody on each uh, country should do it. My, my subject is the uh, role of MSME in every economy. You see, after Second World War, uh, you can see the most destructive countries like uh, Germany and uh, Japan. They, they, they grew up the fastest possible way uh, just because of the help, just because of the MS, MSME. And this role of MSME is not only in India, but everywhere in the world. Today, uh, the situation in India, we have learned a lot from the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And when it's a complete unlock and the situation of the world all around. I think, uh, again, I will say we have to start with MSME. For example, our company, we started in 1954. And which, which is, I will say it's a micro industry. And today, with the all good technology, we are producing tools and uh, we are supplying to all the best producers of the world. And we are happy to happy to share the market. On, on the outset, I will say the recent study and of the World Bank make, made it clear that India has many opportunities uh, to benefit from all and enhanced participation in the world economy and from a higher participation of global and regional supply chain regional supply chains it can also boost boost uh, boost the growth create jobs and reduce the poverty it would very much uh, contribute the success of make it in in india initiative though unlocking the indian economy to the world economy during the process of the deglobalization is not so easy. India's current position in the global economy offers opportunities to the strengthen itself even uh, in a more fragmented uh, global economy. And a first opportunity in this man is in manufacturing to uh, work on the Make in India strategy. India is developing its industrial base and attracting export-oriented manufacturing investments. To further strengthen this position in Indian manufacturing industry, it is important to address many domestic distortions manufacturing in is a competitive when it can com compete with the best global level uh, stimulation simultaneously facing import practice imports, particularly duty-free imports from our partner on the domestic tough. An export strategy aimed at import substitution and export promotion as two sides of the same coin is ideally uh, suited for us. Import substitutions unlikely is a general perception is not 
uh, undesirable. It is not inward looking in the sense of the closing your doors to import rather is focused to developing domestic uh, capabilities and powerless to reduce your dependence on imports. Particularly when disrupt disruption of supply chain and can deprive you critical inputs products. Many countries cons constantly monitor the trend of import and whenever they observe a sharp hike, they engage with the industry to understand the challenges faced in the manufacturing such as uh, such product domestically. Some countries have adopted an FDI tariff linkage with the enhancing tariff for attracting FDI and encourages foreign suppliers to set up bases in their country to serve their consumers. I was uh, talking to a uh, surgical manufacturer who exports uh, products worth US dollar 1.5 billion to India and who has not set up his uh, factory in India. On inquiring the reason behind the same, he responded that the import tariff in India is only 5%. Therefore, he is much more competitive while supplying from overseas uh, to India. Had the import tariff been 25%, he would have set up a base in India, such as a hike, the tariff uh, would, would have also encouraged Indian companies to venture into the manufacturing of those products by making domestic production more competitive uh, than imports. Let us also not swayed by the argument that other countries are not pursuing import substitutions. However, many countries have a market close to our, ours in terms of the size. Import substitutions require that market be of a certain minimum size to make manufacturing viable. Not many countries in the world possess, possess a, such a market and hence they are unable to pursue an import substitution strategy. It is now not necessary to hike the import tariff implement such a strategy. However, an ecosystem was, which uh, provides a level playing uh, field must be offered to a manufacturers. This involves extending the concessional credit to such manufacturers along with the competitive electricity tariffs and e efficient uh, logistics. Currently, in, in Indian manufacturers pay much more higher India, inland freight with supplying machinery from Combator to, uh, uh, to com from Combator to Ludhiana or to Jalandhar while supplying machinery from Combator from Gonzau to Ludhiana is the same uh, cost. Therefore, there's no level playing field. The tariff hike import substitution warranted only uh, to, the, to address the intervene duty structure for specific objective that it should have definite sunset clause. Such a clause is required so that companies scale up and get investment but don't become in efficient due to the com complicacy. We also have to be vigilant such and tariff that they can result into domestic and cartelization of monopolies which push price up, thereby adversely impact the upstream production. A positive environment uh, to in, in, uh, enable to support an ecosystem for domestic uh, manufacturers should be given to the preference over uh, uh, tariff hike. Second opportunity for India is to become food factory of the world. India is uh, amongst India is among top producers of many agriculture products, but there is a huge potential of increased exports. India should deepen its 
its international trade cooperation in agriculture by reducing the tariff and non-tariff barriers, especially lowering the trade barriers for inputs. The path-breaking reforms in agriculture would push agriculture exports. Relaxation in the Essential Commodities Act will encourage exports to produce such uh, products and build inventory without the threat of the hoarding. Removal of restrictions on international state movements will ensure efficient efficiency, the trans, tra, uh, transparent and seamless interstate movement of farmers produce, resulting into a remunerative price. In the initial system, farmers were forced to sell to the government agencies. Uh, now, the, uh, now the farmers can engage with the agriculture uh, processes, export, and even large retailers, uh, particularly those which provide specialization platform for groceries and consequently for the sale of farm product. <coughs> At the same time, many distortions in agriculture should be addressed, like improving the warehousing infrastructure and the cold storage. And India has to adapt its agriculture sector to dif different and challenging climate zones. The third opportunity is the role in India could play the leading nation of an architecture of global markets. We see weakening the multi-materialism and the inability to inability of global trading system to adapt a new technology changes the address is concern on the use of industrial subsidies and the role of state-owned enterprises. We need to uh, it's in the development between WTO members and their WTO obligations, sustaining the rules-based multilateral systems key is the key to address the challenges of multilateral trade system is, is to, um, it's important to have a common understanding of tensions and conflicts. This requires an in-depth analysis and debate between WTO members on the source of the problems, on the ineffectiveness of WTO to address them on long-term solutions. The COVID-19 gives us excellent opportunity to having this such fun, uh, having this fundamental debate on a sort of uh, re-engineering of uh, multilateral trade architects. India is one of the most important global player. There is a room for India to deepen its relationship with the global economy, even if India would act alone on trade facilitation, it would give us benefit in terms of growth of employment. And India, we all could benefit from a strong role of India as its leading uh, nation in the world. A role focused on the improving and the strengthening on the global trade architectures. I, I, I will elaborate in a uh, short way that Today, we need to start with, to, we need to support the MSME industry. Without MSME industry, no country can grow. Uh, if you see India, we have uh, nearly 52% uh, growth from as MSME sector. For, for the development of countries like, uh, I see the Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobacco, they, they said, you are the producer of... Uh, cosmetics and uh, rum, of course, is a very famous uh, rum all over the world. These agriculture-based industry should be given preference, and I am sure that India is the largest market for everyone in the world to come and join hands in India, not only agriculture, but in the engineering industry, also one of the big subjects uh, from India. With these uh, words, I will say thank you very much for inviting me to your platform. 
and uh, any question please tell me if i can answer this thank you very much sir uh, at the moment uh, we do not have questions but i'm sure it will arise soon and uh, we can ask uh, uh, we'll let you know the questions after the next speaker super so thank, thank you, you very much for this session thank and uh, moving on yes moving on we have mr niraj mitran the co-founder and partner of hola mitran and co to talk about the legal framework adhering to setting up companies in india so mr niraj attained his bachelor's in engineering but he chose to pursue as a chartered accountant and has been practicing ca since 2014 mr niraj is a managing partner and founding family partner at Madhavan and Co. Miso, a chartered account accounting firm since mid 1960s, is also the co-founder and partner at Hola Mitran and Co. Bangalore, a chartered accounting firm started in 2015. He is a non-executive director at Axiom Consulting Limited, a public limited company having branches in over six countries. He's also the financial and product consultant to a couple of countries, uh, sorry, a couple of companies in India and North America. And he has handled financial due diligence on behalf of the venture capitalists and the investee companies. His specialization is setting up companies in India for foreign business owners, including consulting on entry into India, funding for setup and for initial operations. So it is great to have you, sir. The stage is all yours. Thank you. I believe I'm audible. First of all, yes, thank you being here and a very well, welcome to all the uh, speakers from Trinidad and Chicago and all the uh, visitors as well. I welcome the Indian uh, friends and members as well. Now, if you see, we always have a mechanism of ensuring that risk assessment is always the least for any business entity and a business structure can help us reduce risks. When you look at all this, it will eventually boil down to financial risk, legal risks, which can be reduced, but there will be certain moral issues which can never be solved. So a structure can help us in reducing these financial and legal risks. Now, moving on, what are general structures? As Ms. De Deborah Thompson was mentioning that there are a lot of structures, including uh, proprietors, uh, partnership firms, trusts, and others, I will be more importantly concentrating on do, only two major structures, which are private limited company and li liberty, limited liberty partnerships. The major reason for me to concentrate only on these two structures is because of repatriation of profits allowed to Trinidad Tobacco for foreign investors. In any other structure, in, in, for Indians to invest, it is very simple to either start a partnership firm, proprietary concern, or any of the other two options as well. But these two are the safest for ensuring that repatriation of profits do arise at a later date in case foreign investors do invest in India. There are also other features like uh, external branch. The only disadvantage is the rate of tax will be at 40% plus surcharge plus education says, I mean health says. And you'll also end up having JVs which are also treated as uh, body of individuals or association of persons. Now, very specifically, the parameters a private limited company or a limited liability partnership, you are required to have at least two owners. And for a foreign investment partner, both channels are available. The base document for a private limited company will be an incorporation certificate, whereas in a limited liability, it will be an LLP deed. There are going to be some amount of advantage that you can get for a private limited company in the tax rate when compared to an LLP. And the incorporation and closure is pretty simple. Everything is digitalized with the click of a button. Uh, we ended up incorporating a company for Singapore yesterday in about two days time. Uh, the incorporation process will follow in about four days time. We should have our incorporation, but for safety, we'll, we'll assume that it is 10 working days. The closure of a company is always painful and the current government has introduced a couple of forms in the recent past, wherein they are assuring that this could happen somewhere around 180 days. Earlier, it could take anywhere up to three years. There is something which is very important for a foreigner when listing, when uh, incorporating a company in India. The most important thing is what happens to investments that he's made. For example, a person invests in a company in 2020 and the company grows well enough and in 2025 he wants to exit the company and the country. Well, will such profits be repatriable to his home country is the most important question. 
in case such a benefit is not available then all the profits of the com company will get stuck in india without him enjoying the benefits of such profits in his home country now even partnerships allow foreign direct investment but only in a non repatriable route to obtain a repatriable route it is a prior approval that is required and this process could take anywhere upward of 6 months and this is non uh, 100% not confirmed that repatriation be allowed now getting back what is repatriation as i mentioned it is repatriating the funds of profits or the base investment itself back to the country now getting back the advantage of a private limited company over llp is that currently the government has reduced it to 22% Uh, as tax rate, and there is also an advantage in case you are following certain specific activities and are able to con confirm your applicability to certain conditions, your tax rate can further be reduced to fifteen percent. This predominantly works with the manufacturing industry. Now, good news is that the company, in case it grows, it can also be listed on the stock exchange. We predominantly have two major stock exchanges, though there are multiple available in the country. one being in bombay the other being in bangalore which is the nifty and the sensex moving on what is a company in corporation what is the importance as as everybody knows members and directors are different and for a company or an llp there should be a minimum of 22 members and a maximum of 200 in the case of a private limited company and 20 in the case of a llp it is mandatory required in india that at least one member must be an indian director one director should be an indian resident what does indian resident mean he should stay in india for a period of greater than 182 days in india as you as you are all aware the company requires a name so the company incorporation starts with application for a name and once it is applied for you will complete the other processes and documentation in the name of the company the company is also required to have a registered address which will require certain documentation like a rental agreement or a lease deed or in case it's your own property then an noc to use it as a registered office the filing process itself as i mentioned earlier is all digitalized so everything will happen with the comfort of your house or your office and there is something called a digital signature that is required a digital signature is not your regular scanned copy of your signature but it is a thumb drive or a pen drive having certain coded information of your pan and your aadhar and other related including photos and everything in a hash function which is seamlessly integrated with the back end uh, government departments and it recognizes a registered registered mark or a signature of the individual owning that all documentation are attested through these digital signatures and the members and the auditor who signs off or the uh, basically you need a professional who certifies that these documents are intact and this professional can be either a ca cs cost accountant or a lawyer now the the most important part is the following now for a foreigner to incorporate the documents in india you will require a copy of your passport a, a copy of your driving license and a copy of your bank statement the bank statement should not be later than 2 months if you observe uh, trinidad and tobago is a commonwealth country and it is also a signatory to a apostle uh, convention signed in hague trinidad and tobago entered into, into into this apostle convention in 2000 and 2000 july so basically for any document to be validly recognized in india these have to be only notarized so what you can do is pick up your in case you want to incorporate a company in india you will have to get a copy of your passport driving license bank statement and reach out to your not notary show him the originals and get a copy attested by him and the same will work here we will need the hard copy for the documents to reach india for obtaining the digital signature certificate mentioned above but elsewhere all soft copies will work now one thing before we proceed we should know something called an automatic route and a approval route India is very free for allowing any foreign direct investment coming into the country except a specific few different uh, sectors the sectors that are requiring prior approval for any foreign investor to enter into India are defense railways insurance construction banking multi brand retail and a few more like that except these specific uh, industries 
all other routes are 100% automatic. So for example, if you want to incorporate a financial consulting company in India, anybody can get those documents, get it incorporated in India with 100% investment into India. Obviously, he will have to comply with the requirement of one resident director in India, but any further money or proceeds that he has can be repatriated without any object. Now, for example, let's take the defense sector. In the defense sector, currently only 74% of foreign direct investment is allowed. For example, if a 100 rupee investment is to be made, at least 26 rupees of, or say $100 investment is to be made, $26 should arise and should be owned in India. Uh, similarly, there are various uh, different sector caps for each sector. To be very, uh, uh, the common questions that are usually asked are what about manufacturing units? Usually, all manufacturing units will have a 100% automatic approval, wherein you will have to comply with the procedures after incorporating the company just to inform that there's a foreign direct, foreign direct investment into the company. The sectors and the caps for each sector may change depending on the notification. Now, when you say a company or a uh, limited liability partnership, these two entities will usually work within the framework of the law. Now, the framework of the law will, is that the Ministry of Corporate Affairs controls the incorporation of a private limited company as well as a limited liability partnership. This is governed by the Companies Act 2013. Any further incorporations is governed by Companies Act 2013. Now, once the company is incorporated, if the if there exists a foreign direct investment, then such information will have to be filed with the Reserve Bank of India, confirming that the uh, fi uh, there is participation of a foreign investor into the company. Post incorporation and compliance with the RBI, the regular taxation laws of India will work, and there are predominantly just two taxes as everywhere else: one being the direct tax and one being the indirect tax. The direct tax is governed by the income, Indian Income Tax Act of 1961. However, the indirect taxes are governed by multiple laws like the Customs Tariff Act as well as the GST Act. Earlier, the GST Act itself was divided into multiple uh, acts. However, they unified it under a single code uh, called the GST Act. Now, with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, what is required as a compliance is that there are certain specific uh, compliances that have to be completed on an annual basis. And there are certain specific transaction based uh, compliances. For example, annual uh, filings will be your balance sheet, financial statements and auditor's report with the department on a yearly basis. And a transaction based uh, uh, approval will be say changing of the registered office of the company, uh, changing of the directors of the company, which are transaction based. With the case of Reserve Bank of India, it is a one time compliance only and an annual compliance also. For any infusion or transfer of shares between uh, two individuals, there will be an approval required or a post facto approval required from the Reserve Bank of India. And you will also have to fill your profitability uh, with the Reserve Bank of India on an annual basis. Just to give you a clarity here, suppose a, a Trinidad and Tobago resident transfers a share between the father transfers the share to the son, both being uh, in residence of Trinidad and Tobago no documentation will ever be required to be filed with the Reserve Bank of India. These in case provided that the first time infusion was recorded. Now moving on with the taxation laws, there are taxation laws with the direct taxes being usually quarterly or yearly compliances. The compliances will be yearly, but there are few minor compliances that will be requiring the quarterly compliances. And with the in case of indirect taxes, uh, you have monthly compliances, quarterly compliances, yearly compliances, and transaction-based compliance as well. So the, usually this is the framework under which all companies which are incorporated from abroad will have to be under. Obviously, there will be other registrations also which are transaction-based, which I'll cover in the next couple of few slides. Now, when you incorporate a company, what is it that you receive? You will receive from the Ministry of Corporate Affairs an incorporation document, the Articles of Association and the Memorandum of Association and the share certificates giving you proof of ownership of such shares. Under the Income Tax Act, you will get your PAN number through which you complete all your filings as well as a tax reduction number for completing your withholding tax com uh, compliances that are needed. Under the RBI, you will get a unique identification number for uh, the filing of the funds that were inbound and successful completion of such uh, transaction. 
Once these incorporations are completed, these are something that you receive mandatorily, uh, or these are prerequisite to complete the incorporation itself. But after completion of the incorporation, there are certain specific registrations that may be required uh, based on region, based on human resources registrations and registrations. Now, region, there will usually be a requirement to comply with the local laws to ensure that uh, the local authorities are aware where you are and how you're performing and stuff like that. These are yearly compliances and these are extremely trivial, not complicated at all for anyone else to handle. Uh, with regard to the employee relations, uh, employee related compliances, there is two major acts that cover. One is the Employee Provident Fund Act and one is the Employee State Insurance Act. Now these uh, have two different limits uh, for, for the EPF or the Employment Employee Provident Fund Act. In case your salary is greater than, uh, uh, if your salary is uh, uh, X amount, you'll have to contribute. 12, the employer will have to contribute 12% of the uh, salary as uh, contribution towards the welfare of the employee on a long term basis. And the employee will also contribute equal amount of In the case of an ESI, if your salary is lesser than 21,000, uh, you will have to contribute, the employer will have to contribute 3% on the salary and the employee will contribute 1% of the salary. This predominantly protects employees with related to pension related funding. Yes, the companies are also required to look after uh, medical insurance of the employees and pre-COVID there was no mandatory compliance that requested you to ensure that uh, medical insurance is taken for an employee. But during the COVID there is a notification release that employer has to maintain, has to ensure that he provides health insurance to all employees. Now coming to other tax registrations, there is a registration for indirect taxes that is required under the GST Act, which is a fairly simple process. Usually all registration will take, take you approximately one to three days to get registered. And most of it is uh, online process and automatic approval process. So basically there will not be any uh, approval that is pending from the department and whatever is in that process of pre-approval that is also getting a post facto approval or an automatic approval. There is an important license that usually which is not mandated, mandated by anyone who is incorporating in India, which is the import export license. The reason why it raises a lot of importance is that a lot of export incentives are available in India. For example, the Indian government actually provides a lot of incentives for export oriented entity. For example, suppose uh, I did read in the group that somebody is exporting milk or uh, uh, milk or milk products based in India. Let's assume the export incentive available is 5%. Suppose the uh, the person is exporting or the company is exporting approximately one dollar of uh, value in exports, he will receive five cents or five percent. This is a mechanism to ensure that we can improve our profit or reduce our costing itself to ensure we are more lucrative. For example, I uh, we claim uh, incentives for a defense company which does about say thousand crores in Indian uh, currency of turnover, and we claim approximately three percent of such uh, exports itself as incentives. So this is a very good uh, mechanism to earn additional monies in India, provided you are an export oriented unit. Further, as I mentioned, there are a lot of local tax compliances that are needed, but usually all these compliances will be uh, a five, uh, three to five day process and everything is automatic. Now, when you say you're a director, when you're abroad, what is your responsibility? See, once you are incorporating a company in India, suppose I am one of the resident directors and you are the other, you are still obligated for a lot of other uh, transactions of the company. There are specific laws in the companies act which entrust your responsibilities in the uh, for the company for uh, and for its employees and all stakeholders, including the government. Now, there are penal provisions also under the Companies Act for provide uh, for ensuring that duties are diligently performed. Any fraud committed by the director, any act done beyond his uh, uh, approved authority limits, non-person performance of duties diligently or honestly, uh, or any other false statement made in front of any court of law or any other department will all have liabilities uh, with the with the director. The liabilities may be 
a fee based liability or a imprisonment based liability for example there is a uh, corporate social responsibility obligation on the companies making a threshold meeting a specific threshold in case you do not comply with it you are liable for a three up to a three year jail imprisonment or penalty of 25 lakhs or both so such penalties will always be applicable and we have to uh, take care of us now getting back into specific uh, regions we have also foreign branches and jvs that can also be set up in india uh, with the specific uh, specific tax rate for a foreign branch it is a more expensive and a more complicated procedure to do it but this can be done there are multiple jvs that are existing in india and indian india per, per se is a very comfortable uh, country to repatriate funds there are certain forms that will be mandatory required to uh, file with the rbi before repatriation and the ca may the chartered accountant or a certified uh, public accountant may be required to attest such documents uh the, specifically speaking about uh, manufacturing industries which are wanting to set up there are specific pockets which are designated as a special economic zone a free trade zone and stuff like that wherein uh, a specific industry itself is collaborated for example there is in bangalore there are multiple sec for information technology for uh, defense related uh, manufacturing equipments for aerospace related manufacturing equipments and stuff like that the advantage of such sec is that the availability of human resource with specific and specified skills are more abundantly available and the company uh, the country itself benefits and the employers also benefit for abundant availability of resources in that specific area finally i would like to uh, give you a quick update on what is india's position on covid and how are they treating currently indian government has provided a lot of loans and uh, a lot of uh, schemes for msmes and there is specific uh, programs if your ip is getting registered in india if your ip is able to be registered in india or under an indian entity you will get certain relaxations under the startup scheme wherein specific number of years of your taxation itself is uh, exempted the further in relation to taxation these scz that i just did mention enjoy a benefit of tax free holiday periods up to 10 to 15 years depending on certain conditions that are to be complied you will have to set up a fresh uh, entity and related uh, uh, compliances with including the human resource generation in case you are employing new human resource in your company the government also contributes a specific percentage of your uh, employment provident fund comp uh, component as an incentive to the employer i believe i have given you most information relating to setup of company the process is fairly simple and should be very inviting for uh, a lot of uh, industries from abroad any questions i am open for it thank you uh, thank you so much mr neeraj uh, we do not have a lot of questions right now but uh, i'll keep looking out for them and also we have reached our time limit for today's session so uh, thank you very much for being with us and sharing with us uh, the information on the legal framework so my pleasure yes thank you and uh, next i would like to invite our national deputy joint secretary of ci msme Mr. Bijay Balagopal, to sum up today's session. Thank you, thank you, uh, Anushma. Uh, so, first of all, a uh, big thank you to uh, all the speakers, both from uh, uh, India and uh, Trinidad and uh, Tobago. Uh, it was a very insightful uh, session, and I hope uh, all our audience uh, enjoyed the session today. And it was really nice to note that the trade relations between the two countries dated uh, almost 175 years uh, back. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, noted down that there are investment opportunities in uh, manufacturing maritime logistics uh, sectors and uh, especially on uh, call center management so that's a uh, good news for a lot of companies in india and it is nice to note that uh, there are uh, business opportunities in uh, technology space uh, in agritech uh, in data analytics software development tech support and uh, areas like that and thanks to neeraj and tabra for briefing us about the taxation and other uh, regulatory requirements so um, 
we hope to uh, see a better trade relation happening between both the countries and more business uh, coming to msmes on both sides so wishing uh, good luck to uh, msmes on uh, both sides so thank you and uh, back to you krishna uh, thank you very much sir so we have come to the end of the global leadership dialogue with trinidad and tobago so once again on behalf of ci msme i take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt appreciation towards our esteemed guests from trinidad and tobago mr philip nags mr siko allen ms debra thompson and mr nirad tiwari for taking time off their busy schedule and for being with us and sharing such in invaluable information and also a big thanks to the american chamber of commerce in trinidad and tobago for their support and ms melissa for coordinating with us and making this event a grand success and also a special thanks to mr ashwani kumar and mr neeraj mitran for sharing the opportunities and the legal framework of, for companies in india i'm sure our friends in trinidad and tobago have also benefited from the same so even though we are 6000 miles apart we have come together today to create new beginnings and i hope this has created new horizons for msmes across india and given a ray of hope to entrepreneurs during this difficult times so thank you and also a big thanks to our participants for being with us till the end today and please join us again tomorrow with our global uh, dialogue with the netherlands so till then good night stay home stay safe thank you so once again uh, thank you to all the participants uh please join us tomorrow same time uh, 7 to 9 we're so talking about tomorrow's session with netherlands please join us and uh, we can have a lot of insights about doing business with netherlands thank you and uh, good evening